for example, here I'm showing the primary road within 25 meter buffer, the total length of that, and in the southern meter buffer. But the question then is what buffer should be used? And also with this type of method, we drop lots of other information from the transportation networks. So like the corners and the curvatures, the traffic lights and round the bus, and that may all contribute to the air pollution process. So uh, can we automatically extract features from the transportation networks? So that is what the deep learning based method are good at. So which um, just, you just fit in the raw data and it will automatically learn features and ensemble features. So here's an example a very concrete example of the facial recognition. So how do you identify if there's a face in the image? So a human worker is going to look at eyes or mouth or nose, but then the question is how do you identify an eye or a nose or mouth? So it's just getting more and more complex. And but deep learning neural networks excel at this work. So uh, the amazing thing of it is that it learns the features hierarchically. So if you look at the um, output at each layer, um, at the lower levels, you see these edges and oriented lines, and then go to higher levels, you started to see eyes and nose and shapes and so on. And then at even higher level, you started to see like jaw lines and side of your face and until the face emerge. So um, I'm going to, um, again, we start from some basics. So the basic element of, or the basic unit of deep learning is a neuron, uh, which is called a perception, a perception. So which you, in the first step, you take the weighted sum of the input and then add a bias to it. And this bias will control when the neuron is activated. And then this number will pass to a nonlinear function, which is commonly called, a, which is called the activation function. So and that this is, and then gives output. So there are many types of activation functions. And here I'm showing two that are the most commonly used. So sigma takes one divided by one minus E at the negative of the input and takes this shape and it's bounded between zero and one. So it's mostly used when we have probability as output. And this one is rarely, which the so rarely shift the negative values to zero and maintains all the positive values. Um, and then we can take different ways and bias and that forms the different units or the neurons at each layer. And the put output of each layer can be the input of next layer. So we we'll have a neural network. And between the input and output layers, we have hidden, the layers are called hidden layers. And this is, uh, uh, this one is, so this type of neural network is called densely connected neural network because every neurons are connected to each other. So the big question is again, how do we optimize the loss, the cost function? So here it's, um, the cost function is the mean of all the, of the loss function of each, the loss of each observation. Um, for the regression problems, like what we had with the global mapping, we take the mean squared error. And for classification, the <clears throat> cost function can be more diverse. And one of them is, entropy. So, and then how do we, and how do we do it? So this gradient descent is probably at the core of the mathematics and the neural network. Um, so if you remember from your calculus class, the class you might uh, remember that sometimes you can solve it explicitly. So like in your simple linear regression, if your cost function is this simple, you can just uh, calculate the derivative when it's equal to zero. But with deep neural network, the cost function can be very complex. So, uh, and we also may have thousands or even millions of parameters to solve. So you can't solve it explicitly. 
and the better strategy is a gradient descent. Um, so this is similar to the gradient boosting where we are trying to look around and find the direction that the Kaos function descend the fastest. And this is by calculating the gradient and the, or the derivative, so the derivative. So here it shows actually this, if the slope is negative, then we can move our parameter to the right and if the slope is negative, then we shift our parameter to the, uh, to the left. Um, and again, we multiply by learning rate that decide our step size, so how far, uh, how quick we want to descend. Uh, and this, we need to do it for every sample. So we need to take the sum, we need to calculate the, calculate, uh, calculate the gradient for each of the sample and then sum all over them. And so if you, uh, so, for, uh, so, for, so that means for each step of gradient descent, we need to scan all over the data. And the data set can be very big, like gigabytes or terabytes. So in practice, what we do is to take a mini batch of the sample to calculate the gradient. And then the next time, another mini batch to update the gradient. So by doing it this way, we don't um, directly descend our gradient to the minimum, but um, take a more zigzagging way, but it's much faster. So do you have any problems with, or questions with the gradient descent, doing it this way? Is everything clear or? So yeah, when I just started, I was worried about what if the, it stuck at the local minimum. So what we are looking for is a global minimum, right, where we descend to the lowest, but as the, Cost function can be very complex. What if we stuck there at the local minimum? Have you thought about this? Any question? Um, uh, uh, isn't that why you uh, to schedule the living rate? Um, no, uh, yes, but that's a, that's a very good point. So yeah, so the answer was uh, if I try to schedule the learning rate, so that means to uh, to have the dynamic learning rate. So for example, when we have, when I have more iterations, then it goes slower to search for the gradient. Um, but if you do it this way, you can still start in the local minimum. No other comments? But that's a, that, that's a very good point. So, um, so the, uh, answer is actually we are not going to. So, <laughs> so what I showed you just now was a one-dimensional case where you definitely see the local minimum. Actually, in two-dimensional case, it's also uh, very easy to imagine this local minimum. But when we have very high-dimensional case, like the neural network, um, actually, uh, what we are going to have is a side open. So, um, it's very hard to think, to imagine multiple dimensions, but you can think about each dimension independently. So if you think about each dimension, then your cost function is either going to be this convex shape, so facing upward, or this concave shape, facing downwards. So you can think the possibility, um, the probability that you're going to have all of these dimensions with this concave shape, with this convex shape, is actually very, very small. So in a 10-dimensional case, for example, the probability is like 0.01 already. So in reality, what we are going to have is a combination of this concave and convex shape. So that forms a saddle point. So that means we always have a direction to go down, and the minimum we found is the global minimum already. So the saddle point, you know, name where the name comes from is because it looks like a saddle on a horse. Okay, so the regularization is again the most important thing because the neural network, uh, when you fit it, it can really, um, you can really fit everything. You can call the training arrow zero. So how to control overfitting is the most important task. 
And again, the region less so pass. We already, as we introduced, it's maybe easier to think this time because we have all this piecewise linear regression. So we actually try to control the overfitting by again, penalizing large weights or large coefficients. And another is the early stopping, which is also similar with the XG boost. So if the neural network or doesn't improve as we wanted to, as we expected, then we just stop iterating. And there are two, um, and dropout and batch normalization are specific for a neural network. So dropout just means to drop out connections. So the ways and bias you learn, it just drop it. And the batch normalization means to initialize the input at every layer, at the layer, uh, the, uh, no, to normalize the input at the each layer. So that means to have the input as mean zero and standard deviation one. Uh, this is because if you, because we have these neural networks that pass numbers and functions, and uh, if you have a small change in your previous layer, this change can be magnified in your later layers. And it's very hard for your model to optimize. And with special normalization, you can even use a uh, higher learning rate sometime because the model is now it's much easier for it to optimize. Um, and now how can we apply it to structured data like an image or spatial temporal cube or multispectral image? Um, so if we uh, so the most rudimental way is to convert it into a one-dimensional array and then fit it into our densely connected neural network. But, but it's, it's not impossible to do it. Actually, it, will, it may still learn some features and give you some results, but it's definitely not the most efficient way because all the data structures are destroyed. So uh, for an image, for example, uh, the pixels that are close together and far away together, they are taken the same way. So remember we have this, everything densely connected. So we are not really make, uh, make a distinguish between that. So um, better way is to use the convolutional filters. So a filter is a matrix, it's a weight matrix. And, um, uh, and it, it applies to your input and this time, instead of taking all the pixels to, uh, to do the calculation, like uh, to put it in your densely connected layer, you just take the pixels that are covered by the filter. And then, uh, and then we are going to weight it some those pixels that are covered by the filter based on the weight of the filter. It is clear. Um, and then this filter is going to move all the way over the pixel. And then we are going to have an output layer. And when we have multiple channels, so like uh, RGB image, we have three channels. Uh, also multispectral image where we have multiple channels, we can apply the same filter to each of the channel and then aggregate them together. And then again, we can add a bias to it and then this layer is called a convolutional layer. Yeah, clear. So uh, we, have, we, have, we can also have different filters. So same idea that we can have different weight for each neuron, we can have different filters. And then that will give different channels of your output. So the number of your channels of the output is the same as the number of the filters you use. Yes. Um, and the, the application of convolutional layer is actually not new. It's actually um, in the image uh, processing like since 20, 30 years ago. And so convolutional filters, they, are, they can, uh, but what is new is that we automatically extract feature, uh, features now. So uh, I have this small R scripts here uh, called convolutional illustrated. So for this, if, you, if you're not familiar with the image processing, 
you can see how different convolutional filter works. So you can see some of them sharpen the image, uh, smooth the image, and some of them extract edges and features of the image. So the convolutional uh, neural network that there are, again, there are lots of architectures. And the one I'm going to introduce today and also is used in the practice is called ResNet. So the full name is the residual net. Um, it's actually, so, um, so why we want it? So it's because when we grow a neural network, we want it to go deep. We want to go as deep as it could because then we can better capture the hidden features, right? The more deep, the more complex features you might be able to extract. But the problem is, it's not always increase model performance when you add more layers. And sometimes it can be even harmful because of the gradient, because then you have problems in descending the gradient. So what this ResNet does is to use skip layers. So um, what it does is that it adds the layer to the layer that is a few steps ahead. So uh, fx is the x after a few um, layers, and then we add them together. And by doing it this way, the layers that are in between, if they are not useful, the weight that I learned is just going to be zero. So that means we are just going to treat them as they don't exist. So with this kind of network, you can, add, you can go very deep because the layers we add to the network won't harm our neural network. Yes, so it's, actually, it's a very, it's quite a clever strategy. Uh, it, maybe it sounds quite simple, but it's, um, when it was proposed, it's really the most, it has been the most popular network and generated lots of studies. So you can see there are lots of variants of the ResNet. So actually uh, trying to know when to do the addition of the layers. If you do it before or after batch normalization or before or after the activation and so on. So there are lots of studies of it. and. Uh, so in the scripts, I implemented two versions, uh, kind of official versions that they um, think it's, uh, that performs the best in their experiments. Uh, so you can also compare the results of few different versions of REST nets. So in our study, we use the REST nets to automatically extract features from the transportation network and then uh, we use the densely connected neural network to um, model other predictors like population and climate uh, elevation and so on. And then we concatenated the output of these two, uh, we concatenated these two models together and then it goes through another dense layer to do the prediction. So this way when you do the back propagation. So back propagation is the gradient, is to use gradient descent to find the weight and bias. You can uh, propagate through both paths. Yes, I, am I too fast or I, I hope not. Do everyone understand? Yeah, it's a complicated subject, so. Yeah. Okay, great. So now we can go to details with the uh, practicals. So, um, you know, Kygo is, uh, uh, it started with machine learning computation and now it's becoming an open public data platform for machine learning practitioners. So basically you can share your data set and um, and, or, and scrapes together and other people can work on your data sets or try with your scrapes. So here actually you can also see the computation and data. So very, and lots of resource. If you win some computation, uh, you can definitely, yeah. <laughs> Uh, not only money, but you can also, it's, it's, really, it's really a quite noble thing. 
Um, no, yeah, but we are. Uh, <laughs> but we are actually uh, now trying to publish a uh, competition there. So, um, so it's not about air pollution mapping, but about the uh, urban building extraction. So we want to. So the buildings, you know, um, want to try to use that to, we want to map like unequal buildings. So the buildings of different morphologies and so on. So how to maybe automatically classify different buildings. So, so no, it's not related to this one, but I'm just saying we are trying to put a computation on it using satellite imagery and then to extract buildings from it and classify different types of buildings. If, based on the morphology, morphology shape, and yeah, you can use all kinds of features. Uh, actually, so, with, like a oh, that's a very good point. Yeah, that's what we think may be the most promising one. But of course, you develop the method to win the competition. Yeah. Um, Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, well, if you're interested, we can talk more about the computation, but we are still trying to prepare something. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so have you all opened the link I just shared? Uh, uh, you have you entered the notebook. Okay. So from here you can see the data. So you can also do it yourself later, of course, to load your own data. So here I so this is a CSV file of the ground station measurements. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, what, what should I need some help here? It's not moving. Oh, maybe, no, I think I know. Just to exit. Sorry. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, Yes, yeah, so you're all in this. Are you all here? Great. Um, so here you can, uh, if you want to work on your own project, you can load data. But here are the data. Why the color is so strange? Um, but this is uh, the data I use, so the ground station measurements and other background variables in the CSV file, and, uh, and this is for making prediction. Oh, no, this is, uh, these are the, all the array files, so the uh, transportation networks, uh, and here I still separate different types, so primary roads. Uh, the first is the primary roads, uh, the first is a highway, and second primary roads, and third uh, secondary road, the first is the tertiary road and the fifth the local road. Okay, and they are all stored as NPI, NumPy arrays. So it's the same as, uh, it's just, you can think it as R array, but they're just arrays. Yeah, so uh, the first step is to install all the packages. So uh, as it's already, uh, as it, has a Docker, it runs a Docker at its back. So many packages are already pre-installed. So uh, we can just simply import it. So the import here is like library. And as is just to give it a new name so that you can, uh, you can just say uh, when you call this new name. Oh. Oh, 
Yeah, the question is, if I do it locally, do I need Docker? Yes, it's all, uh, well, uh, you can use it, of course. Yeah. Yeah, well, to do it in Docker is, well, one thing is it's reproducible easily. And for this Conda, you can, you know, you can use Conda environment. So that's also a very efficient way to have everything together. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's great to learn. So what Docker do you use? You use a TensorFlow Docker. Uh, well, it's just that installing TensorFlow on your own computer can sometimes be very tricky because of all kinds of dependencies and you really have to configure your own drivers for your graphics card. And it's, uh, um, it, it can be a hassle. And that's why a lot of people just use Docker because then you just, it just works. Okay. It's, it's just to do. Because, the, because of the GPU, right? The TensorFlow, it does scale sometimes. Yeah. yeah. It's just, uh, it's just the, the Docker is what most people think is easiest. Okay. Yeah, so the comment is to use Docker when you use TensorFlow, it's easier. Um, and, okay, so um, we already imported all the packages. So here, the, um, I think Chris also introduced in the morning that this Kiros is a higher level API of the TensorFlow that works on all these metrics and arrays that do the deep learning work. So this Kiros really have lots of higher uh, level functions that simplify, uh, simplify things. Uh, here, this import is just to make it easier when you're calling functions. Um, okay, and here is uh, just a setting, the model setting. The batch size is the mini batch when we descend our gradient. You remember we do mini batch gradient descent. And the epoch here, the number of iteration we want to do when we, uh, when we run the neural network. And this n is about the number, how deep we want our neural network to be in the rest night. So um, I, later I'll have another, I draw a figure for it. So it may be easier for you to understand. And the version is for, we have one, two, so for two versions of rest night. And data augmentation is, um, so it's one strategy when we are tra when, when, uh, for training the neural network. So uh, data augmentation is like, for example, to rotate data or enhance data so that we have more training samples. So it's uh, one technique to like boosting the data for better training. Um, and this subtract pixel mean is, you don't need to pay attention to it. It just if you want to normalize data. Um, okay, so uh, here are the versions. So for dif different versions of ResNet, the depth, how it's calculated is a bit different. You, also, you can also skip it for now. And here, now we load all the empire arrays. Yeah, you all done that? Uh, well, actually. Uh, I can't find the data when I copy the uh, the data is uh, again. Yeah, do you see the picture of the object as directly? Is it as directly? Yeah. 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 Open? I think you can directly open the link, can't you, without copy and well, the copy and edit should also work. Yes. You all register, right? Unless I this first set uh, copy and edit. So now it's just edit my copy because I did that. 
Share. 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 Maybe that's okay. it. But it is already public, so well, you should be. There's a way be. to search for data sets in, in Canada. No, it should be with the project mm -hmm. already. But maybe uh, what we can try. Uh, but uh, that, uh, this is a problem with everyone. Yeah. OK. okay. But then I have to make it private. Um, I forgot how do I share because I always make it public. Oh yeah, but maybe so maybe you can try to give me your Hey. Hey. Are there anyone at the sea? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you can upload the. Probably the best way to share the data with us is to uh, publish it as a data set. I publish it as a data set. In, in Canada, because then we can search for it and we can add it to the project. Yeah. Um. Do you share? Hmm. You also didn't receive anything from your email. And So if you just, I think you have to search for this data set. They are already shared. So the global five five, uh, five two two one, and the road six four. I don't think it's hmm. 
I'm gonna do kind of like that, you kind of. Uh, yeah. I, okay, yeah, but maybe now you can search it again. I just make it public. The global 5221. Usually it doesn't work, I'll just go on. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Because I might try a word. Um, okay, so we are here. So here you can load the data so they are in MP arrays. So you can just think it as array. And also I, uh, I just made data binary. So um, the place with values, uh, so values larger than one, I just convert it to one, otherwise zero. And, uh, and it's also very important to uh, pay attention to your uh, which dimension is your channel and which dimension is your number of samples because then the tensor flow needs to understand it so it be, it has to uh, this one has to match what the tensor flow thinks so the if the tensor flow thinks that the last channel the last dimension is the channel um, then you also have to have the last dimension of channel yeah, you understand. So uh, this is what this move axis does. So that I reshape my data. So to move the channel, this five is the channel, by the way. Uh, 64 by 64, the dimension of an image. And this is a number of samples, 5,000. Uh, and here we can also have a look uh, of the data. So uh, just... <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, shall we? Uh, do you want to all type in your email here? And maybe you can just come and type your email. And so, I'm sorry for the. <laughs> Does it send already or? Oh, yes, you can. I'm going to. Thank you. Do you want to? I already click. I click the save once already. Maybe you can now send an email. Oops. 
Indian Mozdak. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you only see one. I, okay, I'm going to make the other also open. Maybe you can see. Okay, do you see the second data? Or maybe you need to refresh. Okay. I just made all the data sets public. So you should see all of them now. <laughs> Okay for you? Yes, I I wanted to have all of them public. I don't know why they're not. Uh, oh yeah, I think it's because of the Open Geo Hub computation, because we might have this computation. So I thought the data set might be slightly related. So I made things close again. Okay, well, that is. Uh, pardon? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, can you try to run it now? Okay, that's great. Yes. It's a bit slow, I think, sometimes the internet takes a while to update. What should I do? What should I do? Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. um, yeah, I think if you just move that. Ah, here. Uh, yeah. There's some people. Uh, ah, somebody else. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, so maybe uh, so maybe you can try it better with the scripts. I'm going to write another person.
Okay. So how can I remove this? Delete. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Let's go back. So here I'm just uh, having a double check. So I'm splitting the data set into test and training. Um, so, so this X train V, X test, Y train V, Y test, uh, the corresponding uh, the, uh, data and the corresponding arrays. And this X train RF and X test RF thing, they are only to split the data frame. So for fitting a dense, densely connecting your network to the background variables. And then here, um, I'm just checking if the dimensions are all right, uh, everything's all right. Okay, and this, this uh, LR schedule is like what you just brought up to schedule the learning rate. So basically we want the learning rate to uh, be relatively high when we just started. And then we are, when we are approaching to the minimum, we want the learning rate to be lower so you can search more carefully. Uh, so here it's actually just basically saying if there are more uh, than 180 iterations, then I multiply it with this number and then just to let it go lower and lower uh, at the learning rate. Okay, and this point and then is the densely connected neural network. So, um, so Kiras is actually making it really easy to do the modeling. So it's also very easy to understand. So in the beginning, you just in initialize the sequence sequential model, and then you can add convolutional, uh, you can add the convolutional layers or just neural densely. Uh, so here's the densely connected neural network. Yeah. So here it says, how do you want to, you know, initialize your kernel? And you can usually just say to initiate it randomly. And then you can use different regularizations. Uh, and then we can, after the, after that, we can do the batch normalization layer and the value layer, so the activation layer. So you can just do this to construct your neural network. You are all clear with the batch normalization and the value now. And then you can also try to add more layers. So add more dense batch normalization and activation layers. Uh, here you actually, here is the number of units. So um, the number of weights and the uh, the different ways, different combination of ways and bias. Okay, and then for the regression problem, usually the last layer, we use a linear activation. And it's because we have a single output, so here's just one. And then we can run this dense, uh, densely connected in your network. So you can see it fitting. So why we have 2076 here is because we have, um, because we have data in a batch. So this is the number of batches, the 264, uh, six. Uh, here you can see the loss and mean squared error and so on, and also how, uh, what, how are they on the validation data set. So you can see uh, it's decreasing. And, uh, uh, and especially this loss function on the, this loss on the training set is really decreasing rapidly, but then the loss on the test data set is decreasing slowly slower and slower in the end. But this here is not, it's not doing modeling yet. It's just to test our uh, neural network. Here, this one. And now we can look at the rest net. Um, 
So last night, I think to help you understand, yesterday I drew something. Um, so here, and if, um, the highlighting is not so good probably, but I think it can help. Um, so it, uh, it has a few components. The first is the rest layer. So just because if you do it this way, then your, because your neural network can be very complex, so you want to structure it a bit. So the first thing is the rest layer, and that consists of uh, three layers. Firstly, we do a convolutional, um, we do a convolution, and then we have a batch norm layer, and then the activation, and then, we have rest blocks. So the rest block, um, the input will go through two rest layers. So this is the version one of the rest layer. Goes through two rest layers and then add it back to the X. So the output of these two rest layers is going to be added together with this X. And this is for the first block. And when you do your second block, this X is also going to go through a one dimensional, uh, to going to go through a convolution on your network using uh, one by one filters. So this is to ensure that the X and Y have, have the same dimensions. Because when you want to aggregate two arrays, you need them to have the same dimensions. Uh, and then this will go to another activation. Uh, and then we will do it three times. So this is located three times, one after another. And the first time we have 16 filters and then the second time 32 and the last time 64 filters. So uh, that is this N. So this N is a number of blocks. So you, uh, remember in the beginning we have it three. So that means we have in the N 20 core convolutional layers because each block has two and then we have three blocks. So it's n plus, uh, n multiplied by six. And then we have two at the third and uh, second and third block. So we have altogether all 20. So that is the uh, rest night 20. And that's where its name come from. We also have like rest night 152. So when you, uh, your network is really deep. You can, you can try different N to see when your uh, neural network is very deep if you can increase the performance. Okay, so with this, hopefully the scripts can be easier to understand. Uh, maybe I'll give you one minute to read the scripts. The, uh, this rest night, the rest night layer and then the rest night V1 is for the first version. I have this figure here. <laughs> and then, yeah, just let me know if it's not so clear.
Uh, is the scrape easy easy to understand or do you have questions for certain parameters or Oh, it's actually, uh, it's the sequence of doing batch normalization and convolutional layers. Yeah, and yeah, well, it's, that's where the other people changed. So these two networks are actually uh, are quite official, so many people already tested them. Mm -hmm. Where you're using the two different versions. Yes, I tried two different versions. Here you are also going to try different versions. So remember to uh, remember we have in the beginning the model setting. So if you set the version to one, then it's for the to run the V1, and if you set this to two, it's to run the V2. And you, uh, you all know what is strides and pipes, piping and strides. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. so uh, the, I still don't actually have access to the files. I'm just holding them. I do oh. have access, but it won't recognize it. So the files are listed in data, but the Python script won't find them. Oh, it's because of the path probably? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure the path is Do you have English language? Yeah. Because I think language is without speech. No, and you can change your language. You can change your type of language. So that's nice. So just keep going. <laughs> so let me. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to share with you the path, and then you just copy and paste it. I see. If it's because of your language.
Did you try talking to him? I'm not sure. No, I shared it. Uh, well, I'm thinking about sending this to you. And I know you you know about it. Yeah, we can talk to the studio. It seems like you're saying that she can see that good. The other thing for this one? This one for the Okay, so So after that, you can just run the model. We can just try to, so here you see the model structure. Uh, what is very handy is this figure. So you can So you can see the model structure, see what you do, and then the dimensions. Uh, it has question mark here because uh, to this step, we are not running the model, so it doesn't know the input size. It doesn't know how many samples uh, we are putting in, but you can already see the structure of the model. It's even just 20 layers already quite long, <laughs> but it's very, uh, but it's very clear what you're doing with this thing. So you see that after one convolutional, uh, uh, one convolutional layer, uh, you do a batch normalization and then the activation, and then you are, and then this is going to go through a set of rest layers and also um, go through a one-dimensional convolution, uh, one by one filter convolutional layer, and then I did that. I did together, and then you just uh, do it, and then to the last. So uh, this is the background information. So here. Are the background information, which is just passed into a densely connected neural network, which is very similar to the artificial neural network, if you're familiar with it. And then you concatenate this thing together. So just to put these two things output together, and then it goes through uh, another dense layer and then gives the output. So you can have a look at this to see what the or what we are doing with this neural network. And and here is just to do different data augmentation. So you can see, for example, if we want to flip the image or if we want to zoom it, to rotate it in a way, because uh, this image, they're just, they're not going to, because this image, they are just adding more samples to the data. And the more samples we have, the easier it is to train, to train the model. So usually um, image, uh, image augmentation a data augmentation can um, help with the prediction. 
and then you can train your data and see see the result. So are you all running up to this stage? Yeah, is it is it finished now? So for those of you who doesn't know stride and padding. Data is so very good. So or you, do you all know stride and padding? So stride is the step size for moving the filter and padding is to pad zeros to your data so that your data have the same dimension as the original data. Or you can do different paddings, but it's just to add zeros at the border. Okay, I, I used to see a very nice animation of it. So the model is running or you're just waiting for the results or do you have any questions? Um, well, I was wondering why you're using um, using absolute error. Then why you uh, shouldn't use it? Mean error. Why not mean square error but yeah. mean absolute error? Hmm. Yeah, that's... Uh, I, I don't see much difference actually between me. I think mean square error is a bit more sensitive to outliers. Yeah, because of squares. So I take more absolute values so because I'm more interested in the general performance. But I don't see very big difference between these two. You can, uh, I think here I'm using both, right? Um, here, so here with the model compile, you can specify what you want to use. Oh, okay, cool. That's great. That's great. Did you check the top of the No, um, I did check it out, but I didn't know it was and they just couldn't be found at all. But then I think that was the full refresh or something that they made it. It just wasn't refreshed enough. It's by the way, Uh, yes, uh, yes, if you do run all, you just run everything. Uh, so here, I uh, well, I, I think I went maybe too fast. Here, the compile is to specify what loss you want to use and what optimizer you want to use. This optimizer, there are many choices, so I recommend you to learn more about it at home because you can't cover it. So basically, so sometimes, um, so having talked about that the uh, local minimum is not a problem, but the problem is when we have the Plato. So when we have really flat gradient, then it's very hard to descend it. So like item and many optimizer is to try to give it more, more momentum. So to let it go fast when you meet a plateau so, you, so that you can descend your gradient further. Okay, <laughs> so uh, yeah, this summary is to give you these plots 
uh, so you can see your input and what you're doing at each step. Uh, and this one is to give you this plot. Yeah, is everything clear? Uh, maybe. Pardon? Oh, yes. Yeah, so the question is if it gives rankings for the predictor variables. And it, it is not, it doesn't. Yeah. There are ways to visualize what separate convolutional layers actually notice in the data. Uh, oh, yeah. It exactly. doesn't really show you what variables are important, but it shows you what kind of patterns it recognizes as being relevant. Yes, so the, sorry, so the comment is that uh, you know we can't see the variable importance, but we can look at the output of each of the layers. So we can look at the weights and the prediction at each layer, so we can see what the neural network is doing, what features have been learned, and so on. You have a question? Oh yeah, it is not exactly this momentum, but I think it's a evolution from that idea. So that goes a step further from momentum. Um, by preventing this overshooting problem of the momentum, because momentum, you can also just go too fast and then miss the minimum. So the item trying to optimize there I, I think it has been a while before I <laughs> carefully read it. So, yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, but this, uh, this item is nowadays probably the most popular one, so everyone's, so most people are using item now. An item? Okay. Thanks for your suggestion. So the suggestion is to use an item. I actually don't know that, so. Um, Learning a lot here. This, yeah, an item. Put a, I'll put a note Um, okay, I think I finished running now. I don't know you, uh, have you all finished training? S still working on it? So it's actually really very, it's, uh, it's very actually, it's very important to do cross validation here to do like k fold, 10 folds or so because we don't have that many data points. We have like 5,000. So um, each time you do it, you're going to get some different results now because you split data differently and that affects it. So 
Uh, so here is this iteration, what I get. So I think what you get is going to be different, most likely, because I didn't set seeds there. So you can see this training error is really decreasing rapidly, um, but this testing error is fluctuates here. So I think it's going to go more stable if I train more epochs. So now this 50 is actually really low because you know, I don't want to spend that much time, but if you increase it, I think it's going to get steady soon. And they said, oh, the, uh, the y axis is the, is the means, mean absolute error. Yeah. And x is iteration. Uh, here are the prediction values. Of course, it's better to put it on a map. It's just showing some fluctuations. And um, here, just for this Kygo, I can't really run it in a large area, but uh, you can try it on your server or a better cloud, because now I have some memory issues here. This is the Road map in most, you know, which area, area that I want to try to show you the spatial prediction pattern. But with the Kygo, I can't do it because I don't have memory. Uh, of course, then if now for demonstration, I should add, uh, write everything into functions. So that's the best way of uh, avoiding the, inf the memory leakage, right? So, uh, but if you're interested, then definitely try it on a server or maybe your local computer can do, maybe your laptop can do better than Kygo, just for more storage. So, um, oh, we are almost one and a half hours. Uh, after that, hands on, uh, we have another one for um, modeling process. So that's again in R, in this R script modeling process folder, where you can see how to do hyperparameter tuning, bootstrap uh, cross validation and mapping. Uh, actually, also the uh, pre processing of OpenStreetMap. So you can see how we implement everything for our publication. Um, yeah, and then I want to thank you very much for <laughs> participating in this course. And yeah, I want to say this is really the best time where if you want to learn machine learning because we have so many materials. And these are my favorite books. So <laughs> if you're a book reader, then some of them are, of course, very classical books like these two for statistical learning. And this is especially for a Gaussian process known as the Kriging in geostatistics. So uh, they are actually also use machine learning in the Gaussian process. And these three deep learning books. So this is really deep learning with Python, really my favorite. And this introduction to deep learning is quite new, it's in 2020. And I really like the introduction part of it. So, um, and there are also lots of online courses that you can really learn a lot from Stanford, MIT, and Coursera. So if you uh, want to learn deep learning or machine learning, then really join their community. Okay, so thank you very much. And then I think now you can just work on so after this one, you can work on the modeling process to see some details of our implementation and make a map. <laughs> yes, and you can ask questions. So you have a um, slide that summarizes the method with some
You mean the comparison? Yeah. Uh, I only I only have comparison between those random forests as G boost and boosting, and they are all in this hands on three, so you can see how they compare to each other. Okay. This random forest, uh, this neural network is very is quite new, and um, now I I think there's still lots of space for improvement. So I'm still making it better. And, uh, and this um, neural network, I think I'm probably a bit fast. So if you have any specific questions about the parameters there or the different functions, how it work, you can ask. Yeah. I, I hope you all understand the process very well. Thank you. <laughs> that was nice. Yeah. Thank you. No. <laughs> Why? Oh. You got an Even if I run, I run all. Oh, did you turn on the GPU, the accelerator? Just try the GPU. Sorry, I forgot to say that because I have it all the time. Wait a second. So, yeah, I said in the morning. So, <laughs> yeah, here, there's a, so if you click on this button. Uh, the last three dots here. And GPU was on automatically. No, it's still going pretty slow. But GPU is going to work. That's probably yeah. because there's a lot of us. I'm on Epoch 4. Don't, don't, don't worry. It's okay. Don't worry. It's okay. I think it's uh, maybe because they, they need your telephone number. Yeah. They do for you to use the GPU. So if you haven't given it to them, probably you're not really using GPU. Uh, from your account. Yeah. I think in your yeah, your setting they will ask you to <laughs> But the GPU they really they let you run much faster. And TPU even faster. Yeah, you should search for it. It makes it even faster. But for TPU, you need to uh, configure it a bit. And it's a code in your uh, in your that you can uncover another. Yeah, you can. But I think they severely limit how much TPU time you can use. Oh yeah, there's uh, quite a lot. Forty hours, uh, thirty hours a week. So and also uh, one, you need to really. Uh, do this end session. You need to end the session. So here, so so here to click it before you close the window. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's going to idle one hour. Uh, yeah. yeah. So you only have. So here, you need to uh, stop. Yeah, to shut it down. But yes. Yeah. So you have thirty hours per week to run the GPU. Yeah. So if you shut down, you can save some time. Uh, so this in this convolutional filter, I have also an R markdown that you can try different convolutional filters. So, um, so for example, if I I, I just need it. 
So here it's how the convolutional neural network, how the convolutional filter works. They just basically still do your, so this is piling. And then this is a one step striding. And then you just aggregate the value. So weighted, I uh, weightedly aggregated the value and then form the new layer. And uh, here you can see how different uh, convolutional filters, which are just metrics that uh, functions on the image. So some extract the edges and some sharpens it, blurring it and so on. Uh, and if you are interested in the oh, and here these calc predictors is just how we calculate our predictor variables, so the road density and so on, and do the regrading and stuff. And this deep learning, this CNN had this Jupyter notebook that's on Kygo. And here the data we use. Oh yeah, maybe just now it has, I should also share, but then it's also difficult to download. But here's the data that we use in the Kago. Uh, and then, yeah, and here's the installation if you want to do it locally. Yeah, I think that's everything. Um, in, well, in this archive, I think probably you won't need it. So, uh, oh, it's okay. Sorry. So here is also how to process OpenStreetMap. So just if you're interested in extracting things from OpenStreetMap, then I wrote a document about it. So there are different ways you can do it. You can download everything, or you can also interactively query it. There's both an R and Python packages for it. And also, uh, I think there's, and also of course SQL and QGS OSM package. Uh, there's uh, this one, this OSM NX, it's a Python package. And uh, I think you can have a try. I think it's really handy. So you can either download the package or run their Docker. So you can just, and it's very nicely documented. So you can extract features and also just do lots of analysis on the open strain map. So. Yeah. yeah, you can make query. Uh, you can also do analysis like to calculate the density and the fastest route from one point to another. Oh, so, yes. So yeah, that is a Python. But it's not only for roads. It's not only for roads, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like this one. Oh, and for the 